Hello, everybody, on this Tuesday afternoon. Um, today, it, always I enjoy my interviews, but today is extra special because not only do I have a professional with neurofeedback, um, marriage and family counseling, and just um, taking our psychological health to a new level with functional and integrative medicine, but I have today my cousin, my first cousin, Ashley Wiegand. So we go way back in, in so many different ways. And it's been really fun to reconnect on a professional level and just to see um, what Ashley's up to. And uh, it's so neat because we have these kind of parallel worlds where we're both working and trying to get people optimally healthy. And we just had a conversation a few months ago and um, we've stayed in a little bit of connection, but you know how it is when life happens and we grew up in a family with loads of cousins. And so it's been really, really fun to hear what Ashley's doing with Palm Health and to um, talk to her today. So it's extra special because we grew up playing out on the farm and <laughs> those kinds of things in Illinois. And here we are both in our professional spheres and able to talk on that level. Um, so I am absolutely excited to meet um, my cousin, um, Ashley Wiegan. Um, she is a PhD, a licensed marriage and family therapist and um, board certified in um, neurofeedback, which we're gonna talk about today. So I especially wanna really introduce you today to the concepts of neurofeedback, um, family constellations, and just the work around um, families and how they interplay with our health and healing. And also um, just the psych psychological readiness to change some of these pieces that really, really I have found way more sometimes than supplements or diet or lifestyle, maybe not more, but at least as important, really, really impact your ability to find optimal health and healing. Um, before I introduce Ashley, I wanted to just um, remind you, you can find all of my free blogs and resources at my website, jillcarnahan.com. And then the YouTube channel now has 70 plus hours of interviews, all free. Um, so please go there, subscribe. It's just under my name, Jill Carnahan, MD, and you can find all of the recordings there. Um, and this will be there as well in a few days. And um, we hope you enjoy all of those resources. So first I wanna introduce Ashley. Um, Dr. Ashley Wiegand works for, from an integrative perspective based on her understanding of neurobiology, physiology, psychotherapy, and family systems. Like I said, this stuff is so critical to healing. Just a tiny little brief personal uh, jaunt before I finish her bio. I just have really worked all my life on my own healing with cancer and Crohn's and all of that. And I love the functional medicine, the biology, the physiology, the supplements, the diet, the lifestyle that's critical to healing. But I have seen a level of acuity, a level of severity and complexity and uh, chronicity of patients that has just really escalated in the last several years. I think partially due to our environmental toxic load, but in another part due to the psychological stressors and especially in the last year. So this is so relevant because what I've seen in my own life, my healing and my patients' lives, if we don't address the psychological aspects and the nervous system upregulation and this fight or flight, and a lot of the stuff we'll talk about today, no amount of diet supplements, nutrition will really overcome. You have to do all of it. So stay tuned because this is going to be breakthrough. Um, I'm going to finish Ashley's bio here. Uh, she util, util, utilizes um, uh, QEEG technology to provide brain map evaluations and detect underlying brainwave biomarkers related to concerns of her clients. Neurofeedback, also known as EEG, biofeedback and neurotherapy um, is used to balance dysregulation in areas of the brain. So again, I'm really excited to talk about this. Dr. Ashley provides psychological and family therapy and psychotherapy. She specializes in working with individuals with anxiety, past traumatic experiences, academic or professional stress, negative religious experiences, life transitions, college-related difficulties, and family conflict. Um, she is licensed in marriage and family therapy, board certified in neurofeedback through the biofeedback certification, and she completed her doctoral degree in St. Louis University. Ashley, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Jill. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, me too. So I always love to start with story and I would love to kind of your journey into this area. Did you always know you wanted to do something in this area? Tell me a little bit about how you got to where you're at now. Yeah, I, I didn't always know just because I had not even heard of neurofeedback probably till I, well, after I got my master's degree. So I think if I had known what it was, I would have picked it because it's this integration that I really love of connecting with people on the personal level with therapy mm -hmm. and then looking at the science and neurobiology that is neurofeedback. So I really like that connection. It's like the brain and the mind, right? But um, my journey was, 
I actually started out pre-med. I don't know if you know that. No. And then, yes. And then I came to organic chemistry and I'm good at science, but I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to, to do that. I knew I wanted to help people and be in a helping profession, but it was so rigorous. That's what kind of uh, got me to the point where I, I veered to explore uh, being a physical therapist. And then when I did my internship at a hospital, that didn't quite resonate. And I always in the background wanted to be a therapist, but have been kind of discouraged from that path for a variety of reasons. So after I tried these other healthy professions, I kind of came back to that. So I finished my uh, degree in exercise science, which worked well later on for neurofeedback because it was very heavy on anatomy and physiology. Then I got my master's in marriage and family therapy. And then it's when I moved to St. Louis and I was just going to a conference, a local conference and one of the local professionals specialized in neurofeedback. And that's the first time I'd heard of QEG is the technical name of the assessment, but then brain mapping is a little easier phrase uh, to throw around and neurofeedback. And it just, everything clicked for me because it was kind of looking at two sides that made sense of you know, our health and helping people. And so you have the interpersonal piece, which of course is so important in the psychology, but then you have brain patterns and how our brain might get stuck. Cause I know, I'm sure you have a patient where they know that they're anxious, right? And they wanna not be anxious, but they just can't seem to shift. And so we can talk about that more, but neurofeedback can really unlock some of that potential um, by, by changing the brain from the bottom up instead of um, trying to be have insight about your anxiety and then change it because you have insight. So after I learned about it, I kind of got to do an apprenticeship uh, under someone else, which is a really great way to learn for about five years. Then I went out on my own. And then Palm Health, I believe, has been in existence for five years now. And I got on board about three and a half, four years ago. And what drew me to there was probably just like your practice. So uh, working on a team, have multiple things under one roof yeah. and um, this multifaceted approach that seems to, you know, have a synchronistic effect where people can get better outcomes uh, as opposed to when you just try one thing. Oh, I love that, Ashley, because what I've seen in my own in Boulder here, right? I have neuropsychologists that I know well and, and refer to, and it's so critical like so many times I call my friend and colleague and say, oh my gosh, I have this patient. They're dealing, dealing with this. They're, can you see them? And we find together, it's such a great team because she can do stuff I have, I don't know how to do and can't do. And uh, I can do the other piece with the physical, the diving deep in the detective work on the chemicals and the environment and the diet lifestyle. Um, so what you, you bring to the table is so critical to getting people well. I loved what you talked about. And again, forgive my ignorance if I say terms wrong, because you're the expert here, not me. But I find like, um, so, so like cognitive behavioral therapy, I'll just tell you my experience that for someone like me, who's super analytical makes it worse. I just get stuck okay. in the same thought patterns, right? When I okay. turned to more somatic based therapies, it was profound because all of a sudden I went below my neck. I always joke. I lived above my neck in my head for the yeah. first 40 years. And then when I started dealing with the somatic and actually heart-based and intuitive based healing, it was profound, but I've also done some of that work with EG and seen the patterns. And it sounds like from your perspective, this really gets at helping them understand the patterns that are keeping them blocked. How would you describe neurofeedback to someone who has no idea what it is? Yeah. So neurofeedback kind of works in partnership with how I use it with the brain mapping and the QEG. Mm -hmm. So if you'll indulge me to explain both. Okay. So when someone comes in the initial assessment, besides some, you know, family psychological intake, it, it involves putting an EEG cap on the head. It kind of fits snug like a swim cap and has sensors in it, put gel in the sensors. And then I record brainwave activity. So that's the electrical activity of the brain relates to brain state, neuropathways, right? We have different frequencies that need to have different ratios and they relate to our arousal or activation, our attention level, right? If we're groggy, if we're alert, so I'm measuring resting state EEG. So there's the medical EEG, which might've been what people have heard, right? If you have epilepsy, you go to the hospital and get a medical EEG. They're looking for spike waves, sharp waves, and to see if you had that medical condition. I'm looking at the resting state, which is the background. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of research correlating that with certain dysregulation patterns. So after I 
get those recordings, two recordings, eyes open and eyes closed. I analyze all of that data uh, in these various databases. So I'm, I'm basically looking at, it's almost like an objective measure of the interface between the mind and the brain. So yeah. like anxiety is a good one, right? Cause there's a lot of anxiety for a lot of reasons that would be a separate talk, but someone knows that they're anxious. They know that they're worrying, but they can't stop worrying. Well, there's going to be certain brainwave shifts in a brain that's locked in worry, right? And so it kind of quantifies this thing that feels invisible, right? Like we might know we're depressed or anxious and not want to be, but so often we get stuck because it's stored in our biology, our neurobiology, our emotional brain, and it's not under a conscious control. Like you were talking with CBT, it's an overemphasis in our culture of things in conscious control, as if we could just hit buttons and turn them on and off and they just exist in us in an individual. And so what's so neat about this is it can, it quantifies that. So I see where the brainwave frequencies, it could be elevated, which means he has too much power in a frequency yeah. in a certain location, right? Or you have too little. So then I go over the results um, with the patient. And typically, even if I didn't do neurofeedback, that also often is so therapeutic because people feel validated. Yes. I love that you're going there because I find even on a food allergy test, when, when they see the data in front of them, I mean, I'm sure you have people in tears time at times too, because they're like, oh my gosh, I've been struggling with this for so long. And you actually have finally like put a name to what's yeah. going on. Right. If there's such a, That's there's right. such a power in that, because it, I think it starts to give them the hope that, oh gosh, I'm not crazy. Right. And we know they're not, we know we're not, we know, but, but what happens is so many people have been in a doctor's office and they say, your labs look normal. You're fine. You know, go home and come back in a year. And, and patients start to doubt themselves. They doubt their um, intuition that something's not right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I've, I've also had that experience where people will cry just from being believed. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so that validates, but then it also gives us and me a roadmap. So then I base the neurofeedback protocols on their brain map. Mm -hmm. And so the neurofeedback then is the intervention. Mm -hmm. So QEG is the evaluation, the neurofeedback. So at its core, it's a learning therapy. As I start to explain it, it, it can seem abstract mm -hmm. and sometimes experiencing it is worth, you know, a thousand words yeah. of showing and, and doing a demo, but Essentially uh, how it goes, a typical neurofeedback session or the process is, so I've localized an area, again, let's use anxiety. Someone has elevated fast waves. That's a common pattern with anxiety. So I put a sensor on that location and then there's a, a patient screen and then my like clinical dashboard. So I will kind of coach them on how to approach the screen. That's where my therapy hat comes, uh, yeah. Yeah. comes into play. But at the technical term for the psychologists in the room is operant conditioning. Uh -huh. And there's also some classical conditioning at play. So it's reward-based learning. So essentially shifts in our brain waves are something we can not consciously notice, right? Like we might notice the after effects, just like our heart rate, like you and I, we're smart, we're analytical, right? But we'll never know what our resting heart rate is, for instance because our nervous system isn't set up to give us that information. Now, if we have an Apple watch, we can find out, yeah. right? But we would never know. We might know if someone scares us that it bumps to 110 or about to faint, but we, we can't notice the subtle graded shifts in our central nervous system in that way. So brainwaves is the same thing, part of our central nervous system, very real, but managed subconsciously. We can't consciously shift it. So what happens is the sensors and the digital analysis of their brain waves makes that tangible, makes that invisible process tangible. So then you can learn to regulate it. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, the quote, the magic is, yeah. right? So again, someone knows if they're worrying or not, but we, especially in our modern American culture, we're not very in tune, right? Like yeah. you said, to trust our intuition, our knowing the subtle shifts. So we become very desensitized to these things, which I'm sure you notice a yes. lot too, on yes. the physical side, right? So I will set a threshold. Again, we're training beta or fast waves. I'll set a threshold. Let's say it's at 10 microvolts. So when they drop it below 10, kind of like the limbo, then they're meeting the criteria, Okay. right? So what they would know subjectively is I'm going to approach the screen Usually, if you're trying to train anxiety, just from a mindfulness approach, yeah. meaning don't try too hard, don't get in yeah. your own way as much as you can, right? Take it in and try to quiet your mind. Now, obviously, someone's not going to be probably very good at it, right? Because that's why they're there with me, 
Yeah. Right. But that's the subjective. That's the instruction I give them. Well, then when their beta drops down to nine or eight, they'll meet their criteria. And so on their screen, they'll get some sort of positive feedback or reward. So they might be a little runner for mm -hmm. my non-competitive folks yeah. who can handle it. And when they quiet their mind, their runner goes faster. Got it. And if they start to worry or activate, it slows down. Mm -hmm. Or they might be watching a, a nature scene on a video. And as they quiet their mind, you know, 10% as measured by the technology, it might expand or go from black and white to full color. Cool. So because of the advances in technology, what's so neat, it's essentially real-time feedback because all of that can be digital analyzed and fed back in less than 200 milliseconds. Wow. And to wow. our brain, that's real time. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Because if there's a flicker less than that, we can't even consciously notice it, right? So what it harnesses the power of self-regulation mm -hmm. and facilitates self-awareness. So these subtle things like clenching your jaw, a negative thought about yourself, this activation you've learned to ignore, suddenly to get the positive feedback, you have to become attuned to those things. Yeah. And then the subtleties of down-regulating it, in this case, gets rewarded. And so then that activates our reward system, right? People earn little points, uh -huh. they win the race car race. And so there's that intrinsic motivation when you get those little rewards. So yeah. that's one session. I can, you know, generally, people will train because it's uh, the best analogy. It's like going to the gym for your brain yeah. is what I say. So you don't do it once and say right. this didn't work, which is obviously not a functional medicine premise anyway. Yeah. But um, a lot of times my work is explaining to people what neurofeedback is for them to even know that they want it because it's not something that people know about. So typically people come to 20, 40 sessions total yeah. one to two times a week. And then depending on how they progress, usually they do multiple protocols, but that's kind of the nuts and bolts of like, neurofeedback. Fantastic. And again, I, uh, it's people more and more are, are looking for things like this because they want to go to that next level. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, interestingly, I feel like the first half of my life I spent dissociating and I got really good at it, which means like yep. we talked about, um, the right. head up, right. So I just like shut away pain and emotion and especially things like anger and sadness. Like those were not okay in the system I grew up in. So I like suppress those things. I neither. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I find it so fascinating because, um, even now the skill there's, there is, that is a, it's a, a coping skill, right? And I learned it and learned it really well. And I, I joke because as I've done therapy work, neurofeedback, all of these things, I started to feel again. I started to be in touch with my psychology, my physiology in a way like you're teaching with um, neurofeedback. And what happened was all of a sudden, I, I feel like um, when you are um, learning dissociation as a coping technique, I feel like in a way it made me more superhuman. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute because it's not a good thing because I could d deny pain, dissociate from feeling and just push, 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 push. But what happened was my body knew the difference. And my body was like, wait, we don't like this. This is not healthy or good for us. And I got cancer and Crohn's and I got a lot of illnesses. I think partially due to the fact I was so good at suppressing and dissociating, but my body knew my body was like, Hey, Jill, we don't like this. Let's, you know, learn. And then as I've done the work around this and, and learned and grown, I actually feel like I sometimes have to go slower, um, work a little less hard and be more kind to myself. A lot of times I teach patients to be kind to themselves, but what happens in the whole, in the end of this is that you are a healthier human being. You can show up more fully authentically. You can actually, if you don't really know how to experience those emotions, you can never really connect with parents, siblings, um, romantic relationships on a deeper level. So these things are so critical to life and life skills in every way. And I, like I said, I learned um, in some ways the hard way um, about that when I really had to go in and, and, and go deep but it's so invaluable because I feel like really anyone who wants to ultimately heal from chronic illness, autoimmunity, um, Lyme disease, um, inflammatory issues, any of these kinds of things that we see, what would you say are some of the biggest um, types of conditions that obviously anyone can benefit, but are there particular types of people that you guys see at Palm Clinic that really benefit from neurofeedback? Yeah, yeah, there are. And there's yeah, probably a certain, some subsets that I tend to specialize in and respond better. So I would say the broad umbrella of anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. So over arousal, uh, nervous system overactivation. Again, there's a lot in our culture and there's a lot of pressure and reward on uh, perpetuation of anxiety. So under that, you know, traumatic experiences, insomnia, chronic stress, 
not being able to rest and slow down, right? Yeah. We put those all under there. Uh, ADD and ADHD, which again is a whole nother talk because I do believe it is overdiagnosed, of course. A lot of times it might be PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, or anxiety, but that one has a medication that people really like, so it gets overdiagnosed. I do think from my perspective of the, you know, the neurobiopsychology perspective, yeah. there is a, a conglomerate that I think is quote real in the sense that there's a certain frequency that is associated with distractibility and that would make it hard to focus. Mm -hmm. It's just overdiagnosed and overprescribed, yeah. but ADHD, um, and those are probably on the ADHD front, if it's in an otherwise healthy family system, motivated like child or adolescent, I get some of my best responses wow. um, for with neurofeedback for ADHD, which is, you know, a lot of times parents are looking for a long-term healing as opposed to putting their child in a stimulant. Yeah. And then the other one, and this is where I get to work in this arena more because uh, I work under our CMO who is a neurologist. Mm -hmm. And so post-concussion syndrome. Oh yes. Huge. So, mm -hmm. and, and that really slips through the cracks a lot in the medical fields, right? It's just like, if you have these severe things, right? A stru structural bleed, something like that, um, like structural damage. And if you don't have that, they're kind of like, well, go on your merry way. Yeah. Well, neurofeedback, again, it quantifies the electrical functioning and dynamics. So sometimes when you whack your head, yeah. that gets thrown off almost like a subtle bruise, right? Yeah. That doesn't get caught. It's not structural. So I'm assuming you can see, um, inequalities in the hemispheres, especially based on trauma, right. Versus like, there might be global changes. If someone has just anxiety or insomnia versus if someone right. had a head trauma, you might see more left-sided or right-sided changes. That's exactly right. Yeah. It'll be more acute and localized. And usually there's the, the coup contra coup, yeah. not, it's not an MRI, right? It, right. No uh, evaluation captures everything, but a lot of times you can see that localized if it's yeah. a head hit, right? And it's usually these areas, frontal temporal areas, whereas like you said, other markers are going to be more global. So those are the three uh, broad clientele, like they're presenting goals. Mm -hmm. And again, post-concussion, a lot of times folks are very sensory sensitive, you know, might have mood dysregulation, headaches, and so they're sensitive to neurofeedback because again, it's a little bit of a brain workout. So that's where my expertise comes in of titrating it, the protocols yes. and the amount of time. But then they're also, again, they're some of my best responsors because they are so sensitive. Yes, they respond sure. faster, mm -hmm. oh, right? Yeah. And then the, the anxiety camp, what I love about it with neurofeedback is this is where I, I would probably say my practice is roughly 60, 40 neurofeedback to therapy. And then I have some that are separate and some that are a blend. Yeah. And what I love about the blend, and this is again, when, you know, someone myself, like myself collaborating with someone like you is, you know, someone might need work for cortisol, right. Yeah. Uh, been running off of adrenaline their whole life, right. Not eating healthy. Yeah. And then they come and get neurofeedback, which sometimes is an easier, easier entry point for people than therapy because yeah. I need to know some goals, but we don't have to talk about every hard thing they've yes, been through exactly. in their life. And sometimes people like that, or they've already talked to yeah. someone and they feel like they've gotten as far as they can. So let's say they're a great responder to neurofeedback and they're, you know, they're having many panic attacks a week, mm -hmm. let's say one a day. So they respond well, they're down to maybe one a week, but let's say they've had panic attacks for 20 years. So they've worked around that by working remotely in IT mm -hmm. for 20 years. Yeah. So now yeah. Their anxiety is 80% gone, you know, but that's where the therapy side and this, like the other things you were talking about patterns, perception, yes. identity, emotional awareness, because they might have less anxiety, but they're not going to have an identity or they're not going to have a perspective of the world that I could mm -hmm. go to a party or get together. I would know what to say. I would feel confident. They're not going to know how to read their emotions when they're challenged, yes. right? There's going to be all these things in the psychology therapy realm that they're just out of practice at the bare minimum and don't have this, the skills strengthened because they've just avoided it, which is kind of a different version of what you were talking about with the dissociation. Yeah. Everyone emotions, right? It's kind of overwhelming to feel emotions again. 
And I can relate, of course, here's yes. our cousin card being played, right? <laughs> Definitely don't be angry. Right. Definitely don't have the negative emotions. Analyze and think a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. we go, we go when we're taught that German Swiss stuff is like- German, <laughs> yeah. Be very stoked, be super productive, yes. right? No, so don't cry. Don't <laughs> exactly. Yes, no crying. And so when you, it, it sounds so obvious, right? But it's so novel when you go through it. When you start to feel your feelings- Yeah. Well, they got suppressed for a reason, right? They were hard. And then if you weren't taught or it wasn't normalized or modeled, like it's okay to cry or sometimes feeling depressed, obviously there's a clinical diagnosis that is very serious, but feelings of depression are also a part of the human experience, right? Feeling anxious sometimes are a part of that, but you, you're atrophied in your skills. If you weren't taught and it wasn't taught to be okay to have those feelings. Yeah, actually, I remember when I first started really letting these up and dealing with it and that, and I remember there was like a two week period when I first opened up on some of these emotions and I was like, oh, completely overwhelmed. I didn't know if I could function that week because I was so- I thought, gosh, this must be what some people feel like to be depressed. Cause I hadn't really experienced that. And what it was, was 40 years of sadness. Like the floodgates were opened. And again, it was just a, it, it was normal physiology. It wasn't anything abnormal. It wasn't a clinical diagnosis of depression, but what I realized was like, wow, this is normal. And I actually had a lot of compassion for myself during that time. Cause I was like, it's okay to slow down right now this week, or to know that you feel overwhelmed or, but it really took some psychological thinking, like really, um, being kind and compassionate to myself during that time, because it was so foreign. Cause I had really suppressed that for so many years. It was different. Other thing that I, as you mentioned, I thought about is like, I always thought I was an introvert. Now, some people laugh at that because they see me out and about and that, but that was part of my highly sensitive nature and the overstimulation and all those things with the brain where I needed to retreat from too much stimulation, too much people. And I could handle little bits at a time. Well, now that I'm healthier in all these ways, neurobiology, psychology, physical health, I can handle a lot more interaction. And the truth is, I think I'm kind of an extrovert. I just was highly sensitive in the senses of the brain and all those things. So that I had to retreat so often. I, I thought that identity thing is so critical because I think a lot of patients are walking around thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, or they even identify with I'm sick or I'm an introvert or I'm, um, you know, too much for people. And all those messages right. can be around this overstimulation of the brain. Right. And then as you get them in a healthier spot, all of a sudden, like me, I'm like, wait, maybe I'm not an introvert. Maybe I'm actually an ambivert or an extrovert that just needs quiet time. And I bet you see that a lot with patients, don't you? I do. Yeah. You can really see that unfold or shift and kind of like what you were describing. If we're uh, suppressing our emotions or again, I always tell my clients emotions are neither good nor bad. They're just information. Right. And then if you're allowed to feel them, they can flow through, they inform you, you know, sometimes it means that the situation is bad. uh, You need to leave it. Right. Or sometimes it means I'm being challenged. I'm going to stick it through but that's a part of the normal experience. But if you were, and I did this myself as well, you spend so much time uh, suppressing the emotions that I think it's draining, yes. right? And so, and then you think you need to perform a certain way. I need to be the certain kind of way because that's the feedback I got from my family system and you know the micro culture that you grow up in. And so I, I also conceptualize it, what you were saying as that, like it takes so much energy to not be yourself yes. and perform <laughs> and be cut off. It's exhausting, right? Yeah. It's kind of like holding back a dam of the tree, you know, like you're holding back a big, you know, and then all of a sudden you, you, when you really um, relax into being your authentic self, um, it it's so, it's really so much easier, even though the emotions you have to deal with, it's so much easier. That's right. It is, but it, yeah. And it's not, there's still the human experience, but it's kind of like, you feel it in your bones, right? Yes. When you're, you're feeling authentic and congruent with yourself and letting yourself be a person is also a phrase I like. Oh, I um, love that. And our body knows, like, again, I look back at, and autoimmunity, autoimmunity, I'm sure you see a lot in the Palm Clinic too. Autoimmunity, if we look metaphorically, it's attack of self, right? Like how more metaphorically can that get is I always right. have some piece of either self unacceptance, self loathing, self um, surprise. There's pieces of that that are always at work in someone with autoimmunity that we always want to deal with if possible, including my own, you know, um, because as we embrace and love ourselves for who we really are, are and how we're supposed to show up in the world, the body like, I mean, will heal. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. It literally is the attack of self and 
And so on my side where what I, you know, educate people on with the, cause I see a lot of folks locked into like yeah. being self-critical, right. Yes. Very negative towards self is so our brain's limbic system, right. That's our danger system. It, it doesn't differentiate between the physical and psychological threats. So when you are self-critical, you're basically becoming your own tiger and, and, and shooting off the sympathetic response. So literally like, oh, I didn't, I haven't changed as much as I want to change, or I, I failed in this way, right? Literally one of factually in, in your physiology, one of the worst things you can do is attack yourself because that makes you more dysregulated. Yeah. And then you can't do the thing you might be attacking yourself for. Yeah. Yeah. I love that analogy. Cause again, this is so important for that overall healing. Um, we didn't talk about like specific brain waves. Do you want to give us a little brief tutorial on alpha versus beta versus delta? Cause I know, sure. some that. I know you're the expert there too. Yeah, I would love to. So there's kind of five main frequencies that we look at in the field. So the slow, the slow waves are delta and theta, and then alpha is the mid range frequency and beta, high beta are the fast waves. And there's also gamma, which you might have heard of. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the, the two that get talked about the most are probably alpha and beta. Alpha was the one that was kind of first discovered and trained for neurofeedback kind of on accident back in the 60s. And that has a lot to do with sensory integration and mood regulation. They think it correlates with the thalamus uh, going to the cortex, right? So the thalamus is the gateway of our sensory information. So it's these large oscillations in the background. So what I see are, I'm, I'm trying to give you the, uh, a summary, but not get too technical because it gets technical really quick and I don't want to bore people. Um, but for instance, if you have a deficit of alpha, they have, there are a couple of studies that found children of alcoholics had a deficit in alpha. Mm -hmm. And so that when you have a deficit alpha, that means you're, your resting state in your nervous system is anxious. Yeah. Right. And so what's interesting is when we drink alcohol, it increases our alpha. Yeah. So you have the self-medication yeah. piece. So that's why, um, you know, if you're not a child of alcoholics and you drink alcohol, it might be fun and nice. Right. But it's not this huge act of empowerment to yeah. not become an alcoholic. But if you have a Delta, a Delta and excuse me, I'm switching my words an alpha deficit, yeah suddenly you drink some alcohol, it increases your alpha, it's self-medicating. Suddenly it's not as hard to be in your own body and be in your own nervous system, right? And so that's someone who would be more vulnerable to abusing that, but it's it's really because it's regulating their nervous system, not in a sustainable long-term way, right? But with a short-term relief. So that's something I love so much about this approach is it's so humanistic. It's so it's looking at the whole picture and not saying like, well, people are just bad and they always do bad things, right? There's usually a reason someone gets stuck in a certain way. So it looks at it from this more contextual, respectful way that I think actually gives understanding and the answers. So that's alpha. Alpha is also really correlated with flow state or being in the zone, which is a really big buzz phrases, right? And it feels really good to be in a flow state. So if you play an instrument or you've done theater or sports, right? It's you're yes, immersed yes. in the moment. There's no self-talk or self-criticism, but you're also not lethargic or sedated, right? You're in that like kind of sweet yes. spot of arousal and immersion. I'm alert. So, I love. <laughs> doesn't it feel so good? And they've, again, there's a, some research on like the secret to, it's not really the secret. It's pretty obvious, right? But when people access the flow state more, their quality of life is higher, right? Their life is more, they have more fulfillment and joy. So alpha is really correlated with flow state and being in the zone. A lot of times it's this prime alpha state where your alpha is elevated, but not too high and your other frequencies are lower. So I can train alpha state or train meditation. Um, beta, those are what we kind of think of as our thinking wave. So those are the ones we could consciously quantify the easiest, uh -huh. right? Like if you're learning a foreign language or if you're doing a calculus problem, your beta needs to ramp, ramp up. It's problem solving, goal directed activity, moral judgments, decision making. So that's brain activation. So it needs, we need to be able to activate our brains for these tasks, right? Where we get into trouble. And this is where I see another pattern is your beta stays elevated. Yeah. So, and again, that correlates a lot with people too much in their head, 
mm-hmm. trying to think through their feelings, think through life. So even if they're trying to quiet their thoughts, they can't. So training down beta would be another pretty common mm-hmm. protocol that I do. If your beta is too low, a lot of times I see that more with ADHD or in concussion, yeah. uh, post-concussion, your brain can't ramp up like you need it to. So you feel kind of uh, overwhelmed or you forget things, drop tasks, that sort of thing. So then the slower waves, these correlate with unconscious processes. So they're a little bit trickier for people to train in session with me. Now, if someone's pretty good at uh, being intuitive and letting go, then they can, they can train these. But when people want to be able, this is probably the number one question I get from new clients is I don't know what I'm doing to get the feedback. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which I have a lot of empathy for. Yeah. Right? Cause we really want to understand it. And again, in our culture and society, we really overvalue conscious processes yeah. and ignore and neglect subconscious processes, right. And the emotional and the messy. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I coach my clients with saying is that, well, that's normal. It's because the technology is sensing these shifts in your brain waves, which no one can sense fluctuation in their brain waves. We might know if we're more focused or if we're, again, we're more tired, but we can't actively sense the in real time shifts. Yeah. So that's why you can't feel it, which is why you need the neuro- neurofeedback. It's giving you information you don't already have. But so Delta and Theta, Theta correlates with, uh, I think, limbic system function. So more midbrain, uh, deeper brain function. So it's also not really, also beta is more our external focus and theta is more internal regulation. Yes. So a natural time when our theta might go up and we'd go more in a theta state would be really deep forms of meditation when you lose track of self, yes. which is kind of a fun state if you've ever been in it. If your people are hypnotized, uh-huh. they're going more towards theta or if you're in that real daydreamy state, right? Like say it's, sunny and you're swinging in a hammock and you're, you're kind of awake, but you're Uh kind of not, and you're kind of in this like kind of fun woozy state, so to speak, that's more theta. Um, and again, I see that that's a common pattern if people are fatigued or have brain fog, but then also a certain kind of ADHD people have above average levels of theta, which is interesting. and, And not surprising is that used to be a differential marker to diagnose ADHD that could be used to differentiate it from something else an elevated theta beta ratio. But in the last 15 years, they've done that again, and it's no longer a differential marker. And they think it's because kids on average are getting like two less hours of sleep yes. than they used to because of smartphones and tablets mm-hmm. and everything. So we have kind of this epidemic of not enough sleep. Yeah, And so that marker now may just mean someone is not sleeping enough uh, and getting low levels of sleep. And then last Delta, that's probably the one that's trained directly the least. It's kind of the foundation of all the other frequencies. So it's, I think they correlate, they think it correlates with, you know, brain stem and deeper brain function, kind of those regulatory processes, right? In the background that are really important, but they're subconscious. They also correlate with deep sleep, like the Delta. It does, that's right, yep. It correlates with deep stages of sleep. And then when I see it elevated in my office, it might be, again, brain injury or learning disability, yeah. or sometimes by folks that have these autoimmune clusters of symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, Lyme, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. So those are that's your quick run through. Okay. No, that's brainwave. super helpful. And it's interesting because, again, the neurofeedback side, and then like um, I've been playing with PEMF maths and uh, pulse yeah. electric- lights on the brain and my specific, I have a via light, which is this device that does a mitochondrial brain light stimulation. And there's some data on that. It's still kind of controversial, but my particular frequency is more alpha, um, alpha wave frequency. And it's interesting to me because my experience, when I had the worst of the mold about five years ago, I had a lot of trouble with focus and concentration and that alpha, whatever it was, it really helped me get into that state. Um, and then the, um, nutrient theanine, I love to use, I don't know again, how much data there is on that, but those are just like my little simple hacks of kind of feeling that focus and clearness without any anxiety. Uh, again, layman's term for what you just described. And I feel like that alpha is so critical to that state, which is again, what you were, you're saying, and you're saying many people are stuck with too much beta related to alpha, or maybe too much theta related alpha. And they're more like unable to focus. 
Is that? Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, too much beta related to alpha or that marker that used to be yeah. for ADD, ADHD yep. was too much theta related to beta. Ah, got it. Got it. Because beta, you need to. Yeah, beta, beta. Interesting. So fascinating. And so fascinating that these hurts, like there's mimicking of our EEGs, the PMFs, like they're all around our, our world. There's other mimics of these frequencies that I obviously have an effect on us. And I always wonder like the stress of the environment, the um, electromagnetic frequencies. Um, I don't know how much data we have some data, but it's not super, pro, you know, sound yet, but I have no doubt that a lot of these other things are affecting our bodies and brains more than we even think. Right. Right. I agree. Yeah. I think the data is still coming uh, along, but I think it would make sense. I, I believe, again, I'm not an electrical engineer, so yeah. I'm reporting this from someone else, but that the fluorescent lights, I think, yeah. emit a high beta. And oh. so when people are really sensitive, it would make sense that we're absorbing that in our physiology, right? And there's that law of physics that if you have a tuning fork, right, if it's yeah. bringing it a C note and you bring it by another one and it absorbs, well, obviously we absorb as well waves. So it would be a, a you know, reasonable hypo hypothesis to think that, well, if you're absorbing beta, especially if you already have too much, that that could be activating, overactivating in your body. Yes. And then another line of thought on the reverse is that a fire has a slow flicker rate. Like if you're sitting by a fire, probably in the Delta range, yeah. and then that might be why it's so calming to be by a fire wow. because there's that slow flicker rate. So yeah. again, I don't have data to back that up. Okay. So think of that as anecdotal from uh, talks with colleagues and working. And yeah. And again, I, same with me, I'm not the expert, but I do know like the Schumann frequency is the earth's natural resonance. Okay. And that I think correlates more with some of the Delta, th like some of the calming, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think seven or eight Hertz. What I think it's that, yeah. Or is it 7.8 maybe yes. or yes. Yeah. So that would be right at the bridge of theta and alpha, which is okay. an interesting it's interesting to think about that because there's a common training uh, in neurofeedback as well. It's called alpha theta training and they use it a lot. People have anxiety or we use it when someone has um, past trauma, but a lot of times it's someone cut off from their emotions, Yeah. Wow. right? And so you train alpha and then once you get better at training your alpha, then they train someone in a theta state, which can be this kind of, uh, again, interesting, almost hypnagogic state. Yeah. And so it's interesting that the Schumann residence is right at the cusp. Right in there. Yeah. Well, and I'm guessing too, again, this is just off the cuff, so I may not be accurate, but I, I'm guessing that when you access theta a little bit, you, what you're talking, there's almost a subconscious state where you're right. open enough to, and I find in seeing the somatic therapies in patients and even in my own life, when you're open to the subconscious and the intuition, that's where a lot of the powerful healing shifts come from because our body knows what to do, right? It's just a matter of shutting off the brain long enough to feel and heal. So yeah. I'm noticing that that's part of why it helps because you're actually able to uh, access what your body already knows to do, which is your subconscious programming. That's right. Yep. That's it. You're exactly right. That's, um, that's what it's kind of thought of that you're training into yeah. accessing the subconscious, which is why it needs to be done by a professional. Yes. Because, yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. If someone has traumatic memories, you don't want to yeah. do that right away. If right. someone doesn't, then it's a little less risky and a little more just exploratory and, and fun. Awesome. Oh gosh, Ashley, this is so fun. We could talk for hours. <laughs> We're going to do yeah, I, um, I could. Any, like, uh, like, obviously you're having great success. I think what you're doing is so important and so powerful. Um, a couple of things, like, first of all, where can people find you? Um, if they're, especially if they're in your area, go ahead and give us your website or your, um, wherever we can find information about you and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So I work at Palm Health. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. So you could just go to our website, Palm Health. Dot com. It's spelled just like it sounds. Cool. And then if you want to know more about me, I would just be under the about tab under the staff awesome. uh, bar. And then I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, the, the address and the number would all be on the website. So Palm Health and we're on all the social media yeah. And I will include that link for all of anywhere you're listening here. We'll have that link. Um, if you want to find out more and more about neurofeedback. What if they're, you know, um, Rhode Island or Washington state or somewhere, where would they find someone that does what you do? Is there a professional organization or someone that you think it, that you like, say someone calls from out of state and they can't see you. Is there any, like, uh, how would they find a provider like you? Yeah, that's a good question. So there is a professional organization that manages a directory of that. So it's called BCIA. 
.org, .org. So that's the certification alliance for biofeedback and neurofeedback. So I really encourage exactly what you said when people try to find me and I only can see people in Missouri. Yeah. We go on that website and there's a tab right at the top. It says find a provider and then okay. you type in your zip code. So it's, right. what's useful about that is it's a directory to find resources, you know, providers in your area, but also that is the organization that certifies people. So you have some experience and quality control because neurofeedback is a specialty you add onto something else. It's not a profession by itself. So you unfortunately get a wide array of experience and training of people in the field. But BCIA, if you go there, they're certified, they've had this universal training we all have to have, passing the test, certain mentorship and continuing education. So that's where I always direct folks. Good. Perfect. I, that's actually what I was going to say is because I've seen like hairstylists put out where, you know, and I'm like, oh, right. you know, like what you talked about is so critical because you have this family marriage counseling degree, you have your PhD, you've got a lot of background because that container creating a safe place for people to do this is really, really important. So just if you're listening out there, make sure you find someone like Ashley, who's credentialed, who has the training and ideally who has some other background, because what happens with some of the stuff is things come up, right? right. And if you don't create a safe uh, space, that's safe for that to happen with the proper, um, you know, titration of the therapies, it, it can be really overwhelming or too much for people. So that's all right. Awesome. Ashley, thank you for today. It was so fun to talk to you. And I know this was awesome information for everybody listening. Thank you so much for having me. This went so fast. And I know. It was so fun. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.